you're about to make love, this is not a time for a careful disquisition on the biomechanics of arousal. <laughs> Shh, you'll break the spell. Don't want to interrupt important things with science at all times. And I appreciate that, and I think a lot of people think that. I'm sullying a, a sort of sacred precinct by even talking about how science could explain creativity or the mind or ethics or any of these wonderful things. I'm Dan Dennett. I'm a philosopher. I'm interested in how the mind works. And for me, that means I'm interested in the science of how the mind works and how we might actually create something like a mind and how nature has created something like a mind, how it could have evolved in the first place. I think the ultimate question each of us asks is, what am I and what am I here for? What's the meaning of life? We're making a lot more progress on the first question, what am I, than on the second. But I think we can see that the good answers to what is the meaning of life depend on getting clear about what we are and how we got here. When I was a freshman, I read Descartes' Meditations, Cognitive Ergo Sum. He said, the one thing that's really certain is that I'm thinking and that I am conscious of my thought. When I think I know, I think I know that I am cogito ergo sum. And I was immediately struck by how brilliant it was and how wrong it was. I never had a moment's hesitation it was wrong. And the question was, well, if that's wrong, what's right? And I've been working on that ever since. When I wrote my first book, Content and Consciousness, back in the 60s, I suppose the fundamental feature of the perspective shift that I was trying to propose was a certain turning inside out of the ego, of the self, getting rid of the idea that I am some agent that sits in the middle of my brain and then runs the body like a puppeteer. And this has implications for how you do theory that are initially extremely counterintuitive It means, for instance, that if you're doing a theory of vision, you have to break the idea that the product of vision is a picture in your head. Because if you've got a picture in your head, you've got to have some little guy looking at the picture. We have to move beyond that and realize that, no, there's no little picture in the head. What I saw was that you have to take the work that that little man in the brain does and you have to distribute it around in the rest of the brain and the body. So you have to get rid of that show place in between the ears where the little man sits and that's, that's a hard job, but that's the job I've been working on all these years. Right now, there are millions and millions, billions of little symbiont visitors inhabiting my body and they're in my hair and my skin and my gut and swimming through my bloodstream. Oh, help, isn't that awful? But of course, most of them are entirely benign and some of them I couldn't live without and we're a happy team. And I suppose what I'm trying to do is to get people to think the same way about their brains. And there's nothing but mindless neurons in there. The factory is empty. There's no big boss in there at all. It is an unsettling thought, but you can get used to it. And once you do, you realize that that's what you are. It doesn't mean that you don't exist. It just means that's what you're made of. If I could give a prize for the single best idea anybody ever had, I'd give it to Darwin. Before Darwin, I think it just stood to reason for just about everybody that it takes a great big magnificent wonderful intelligent thing to make a lesser thing. You never see a pot making a potter, you never see a horseshoe making a blacksmith, it's always big fancy smart things making the stupid things. And Darwin turned that just upside down, said no, we can have an absolutely mindless, ignorant, mechanical process which generates minds.
then we could begin to see how the sorts of things that minds do, that is to say, designing things, creating things, inventive things, could be done by matter. So I would put Darwin as uh, uh, the, the opener of the age, and then I guess I'd jump to Turing, because Alan Turing is the one who then saw how to demonstrate mind arising out of matter. Turing saw that with great clarity right from the outset, back in 1949, when he published his classic piece, Can Machines Think? He was already thinking ahead to the world of artificial intelligence. He saw how you could eliminate the smart mind from processes that heretofore had always taken intelligence and create a machine which could take over simple human tasks of computation and by imaginative extension, anything that any calculator or thinker could do. An algorithm is a procedure that requires no intelligence. It's just a mechanical procedure. And that's what our minds are made of. Lots of little bits doing very rigid, ungraceful, inflexible things. But when you put them together in enough numbers, in enough ways, the result you get is that wonderful, lifelike, mental world that we exhibit to ourselves and to others. A few years ago, I was interviewed uh, for an Italian newspaper, and the headline was, Si, abbiamo un'anima, ma è fatta di tanti piccoli robot. Yes, we have a soul, but it's made of lots of tiny robots. <laughs>